Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Becoming Podcast. Another wonderful guest with us today, Kim Elia, coming to us from Florida. Um, Kim will introduce himself a little bit more in a moment. But uh, before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Share at uh, webdesignshare.com for all the wonderful help that she's been doing. So again, Share, hey, thank you very, very much. Kim, hey, wonderful to have you on, on board here. Um, thank you for coming on. I know in Florida it's a bit of a time difference, but uh, um, thank you very much. Can you introduce yourself um, to the listeners, please? Sure. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me on. Yeah, so my name is Kim Alia, and I've been practicing homeopathy for about 37 years now. I also teach all over the world, and I'm also involved with uh, a company called Whole Health Now. Uh, and most recently, we produced a film called Introducing Homeopathy, which was premiered at the Joint American Homeopathic Conference in Reston, Virginia. And it was actually viewed uh, over this last weekend by about fifteen to 20,000 people. And we've received overwhelmingly positive feedback about that. So we're very excited about the incredible encouragement from the homeopathic community. Uh, we're currently in negotiation with Netflix to actually have it released on that venue, on that platform. And we're also in discussion with Morgan Freeman's production company to have Morgan Freeman narrate the film for us. We actually have an interim narrator who did a fabulous job. She's a Shakespearean actor and did an amazing job. But obviously, you know, having the voice of God narrating a film about homeopathy does carry a certain amount of uh, credibility and weight that uh, anybody else would be hard pressed to, to uh, replicate. So yeah, uh, I'm that's sure. a little bit about myself and yeah, yeah, oh, that, that's wonderful. He come on and do that. That's that's wonderful, and and it shows the reach um, that you're that you're getting with this. I mean that that uh, a lot of support worldwide. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're we're very excited. We we our objective in making the film was to make homeopathy a household word, and we believe this film can achieve that objective because. First of all, we've interviewed about 35, 40 medical doctors, 20 naturopathic doctors, numerous lay homeopaths, a number of PhDs, uh, experts in the placebo effect, uh, medical doctors. We, we have two Nobel laureates in the film, uh, um, uh, Luc Montagnier, who passed away a number of years ago, and also Dr. Brian Josephson, who uh, actually won a Nobel Prize for an area in quantum physics, is actually an area of quantum physics called the Josephson effect, which is named after him. So we've got a really incredible lineup of people who were interviewed in the film, and also very compelling stories of people's lives being transformed through homeopathy. And those are incredibly compelling and very emotionally impactful. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Now, that is, and I'm so looking forward to that uh, coming out on somewhere where we can watch it over here as well, because I have heard about it from, from other people. Can we just um, go back um, quite a few steps here? For those that have no idea what homeopathy is, is it possible just to give a brief about what it is and, and how it works, please? Sure, sure. Well, homeopathy basically is the application of the law of similars, and it was uh, first realized by a German physician by the name of Samuel Hahnemann in the late 18th, early 19th century. And uh, basically what it what it does is you, it, the idea is that if you give a substance uh, to a healthy person and it produces certain symptoms, that it can resolve or mitigate or even cure those symptoms if they arise naturally as the consequence of a disease process. Now, at first, that might seem a little strange. Like, why would giving something that produces the same or similar symptoms cure those symptoms in a, in a person with a particular health issue? But you have to understand that the symptoms that the body produces are actually an attempt of the body to bring itself back to a state of health and balance. So, for example, if you ate a poison, how would your body respond? Well, it would respond by vomiting, diarrhea, perspiration, fever. All of those symptoms are the attempt of the body to bring itself back to a state of health and balance. If you give something to stop the diarrhea, to stop the vomit, you're actually working against the natural direction the body was moving towards. In homeopathy, we give a very small amount of a substance to stimulate the person's immune system and their life force to move in the direction that it was naturally moving in, but which was not able on its own to simply address the condition altogether. So we basically work with the body as opposed to against it. Right, right. Uh, and the people that are that are looking at this for the first time will, will have a lot of questions, a lot of queries. Um, but who is it for? Is it for everybody or is it, uh, is it a select 
people that can you know, take homeopathy? No, I mean, homeopathy can be used for really almost any health condition, any age group. Uh, it doesn't matter the environment that you're living in. Uh, it really works across the board. Uh, it's really effective when it's individualized. So what we need to do in home, like for example, you know, people will oftentimes say, well, can homeopathy treat Parkinson's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? And yes, it can address those types of conditions. And it can even address very serious conditions like advanced stages of cancer. But we don't have a remedy specifically for Parkinson's or for cancer or for headaches because we always have to individualize the remedy based on the symptom pattern that the person is producing. Not everybody who gets Parkinson's or gets migraine headaches or has digestive issues has exactly the same symptoms. And it's those symptoms which guide us in the correct remedy choice. Right, right. So virtually everybody on the planet can use it. Now, is it just for humans? Oh, no. No, actually, in, in the film, Introducing Homeopathy, which you can, if you want to see um, a trailer for or little clips of, you can go to introducinghomeopathy.com. Uh, you'll see we actually have on the website a little video footage of an animal, a dog, uh, by the name of Joker, who uh, ran into a boulder and had uh, part of his bone die in his hip, or I think actually in his knee. And uh, he was treated homeopathically by a veterinarian. And uh, the bone grew back, which is quite remarkable because there's not a lot, a lot of vasculature in the bone. So normally that doesn't heal by itself. So yes, it can be used in veterinary medicine. It's used, uh, it, we actually went over to the UK and we filmed a number of farmers who are using homeopathy to increase their crop yields and to improve the health of their livestock. So that's one of the amazing things about homeopathy. It's definitely more than placebo effect because when you give it to animals or babies and they respond positively, that cannot be attributed to the placebo effect. No, no, you're right. And, and, I, and I put that to you because um, I've been using homeopathy for so many years, well over 40 years. Um, and I'm also trained in holistic animal therapy. And part of my training with that in New Zealand was homeopathy. And of course, we'd be, I was using that when I had my health retreat in New Zealand. Um, I had my own dispensary and all the local farmers were coming around as well. So we were putting drops into their troughs, their water troughs, as well as administrating, you know, administering direct to the animals in that as well. And uh, wonderful effects. And as you said, um, animals and, and babies don't have this, the, what is it, a critical factor, the thinking mechanism that starts to think, oh, no, this can't work. No, no, it's not possible. But when it works for, for children and, and, and animals, it really shows the, the power and ability, really, of homeopathy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've seen in my own personal experience, just, you know, uh, people being given remedies who didn't believe in homeopathy at all. And it worked magnificently. I remember really early on in my study of homeopathy, this is going back probably about 36 years ago, I was visiting with my parents who lived in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, my mom was a very difficult individual. She was very uh, pessimistic and pissed off and angry and unforgiving. I mean, when as a child, if I had, if she perceived that I had done something incorrectly, she wouldn't talk to me for six months. And I was visiting with my my parents, and my father was simply fed up with my mom, and he was ready to get divorced. And uh, I was reading at the time um, what was called the Stolen Essences of George Vitokas. George Vitokas is a very well known homeopath from Greece, and I got to the remedy called nitric acid. And it was as if George Vitokas personally knew my mom and was simply describing her in the book. <laughs> and I knew enough at the time to ask for what are called confirmatory symptoms, symptoms that confirm that this is the correct remedy for that person. And so I asked my mom, how do you feel about pickled herring, which is one of the food desires for nitric acid? And she said, oh, I love it. So I gave her nitric acid 6C four times a day. I do it a little bit differently now because of some things I've learned, but I didn't know uh, everything that I know now about homeopathy, but I gave her the six, the nitric acid 6C, and my mom went through a miraculous transformation. She went from this negative, difficult, unforgiving, impossible human being to someone who was literally singing and dancing around the house. And I, I remember um, she was dancing and singing to Can't Buy Me Love by the Beatles. And you, Jamie, you've probably heard the expression, you can't be a prophet in your own hometown, you know, where... Mm -hmm. 
you know, you, your, your family members and your friends always perceive you in the same way. And, you know, now you're 40 years old and you want to start a business and they remind you how, when you were three, you tried to sell lemonade on the street corner and it didn't work out. And you said, well, yeah, but I was three then. And now I'm, you know, 45. And, but they always perceive you in that same way. Well, you know, I had that dynamic with my dad, but after he witnessed the transformation of my mom, he came up, he shook my hand. He said, I don't know what you've done, but from now on, I support you 100%. Wow. So, you know, I've seen these profound transformation in people's lives. And it's wonderful to bring that to the larger world community because everyone deserves to know about homeopathy and the power it has to transform people's lives. Very much so. So, you know, that story there, is that how it all started for you? Was that the beginning of homeopathy? Well, it, it actually, it actually is. That's a great question, Jamie. It actually started, uh, I was the director of nutrition at Heartwood Institute in Northern California. And I was working with a lot of people nutritionally, but at Heartwood, everyone was eating all organic food and chewing their buckwheat sprouts 2000 times per mouthful. And you know, there wasn't really a lot I could tell them about how to eat better. So uh, I was looking for some other type of therapeutic modality to add to my nutritional practice. And I walked into a, a local health food store and there was a book in there by Maisie Panos. And on the back of the book was a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. And the quote said something to the effect that homeopathy is, is very in, inexpensive and the most effective system of medicine on the planet. That quote really caught my attention because I knew that Gandhi had wanted the people of the Indian subcontinent to have pride in their own cultural accomplishments and for the most part to reject things from the West. And as you, I'm sure you know, in India, they have a thousands of year old medical system called Ayurveda. Yet somehow Gandhi was advocating for homeopathy over Ayurveda. I thought, how is that possible? So, you know, I purchased that book. I brought it home. I read the whole book that evening, ordered a remedy kit. I began to give remedies out, you know, within a week of actually having read it. And that was really my initiation into homeopathy. And then shortly afterwards, as I said, I had incredibly powerful experiences giving remedies to people and seeing their lives just change completely. You know, their health issues go away um, and not just their physical health issues, but even their mental and emotional issues get in improved dramatically. Uh, there's an aphorism in the organ on the organ is kind of the Bible of homeopathy. It's not a religious text, but it's kind of the, the book that, uh, that Hahnemann wrote uh, that basically tells you how to practice homeopathy. And there's a particular section in there where Hahnemann actually says that, the, the purpose of homeopathy is to allow you to reach the lofty goal of human existence. And in another area of his writings, he says that the lofty goal of human existence is the ability to, to use your life energy, the talents that you're born with, to do good work in the world, to, to make this world a better place, to serve all living beings. And uh, that's what homeopathy has done for me and what I, I believe it can do for the rest of the, the, the people on, and animals on this planet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's wonderful, it really is. I mean, going through this, going through this when you were studying and, and making it a part of your life, it, it certainly, I was going to ask a question, did you have to make changes in your life? But the changes seem to happen for you as you, as you are developing and getting into this and learning and, and studying and then sharing um, and then working with people as well. I mean, the, the changes in your life, I mean, you've been taking them as well, I'm sure, like I do. Anytime there's any sort of symptoms come up, I go to the homeopathy cabinet and and, uh, and look for you know, the remedy that I need. But for you, your lifestyle and yourself, I mean, when you're traveling, and it sounds like you travel, you know, travel a lot, um, you take a kit with you, you have something with you all the time. You know, I, I probably should carry a kit with me, but usually when I go someplace, I'm going to a, a homeopathic conference or a homeopathic school or friends who practice homeopathy. So normally when I get to a particular location, there are remedies available to me. I probably, though, should carry remedies because, you know, sometimes you're on an airplane and, has, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but on airplanes, like if you take a Petri dish and you put it in a first grad, first grade classroom setting, it'll grow like 15 different strains of bacteria. If you put it on an airplane, it grows like 280 strains of bacteria. Really? So, and then you've got, the, oh yeah, it's just unbelievable. And then, you know, then you've got the issue of low oxygen and no, no water. So it's a very toxic environment. And so, yeah, you can feel bad. And I, I probably should be bringing remedies with me on, on the flights as well. Yeah, it's a good yeah. suggestion. <laughs> now, are there, I mean, I know there are different ones, but there are, there are different types of homeopathic remedies. I mean, there's the very, um, the, the traditional 
um, type of homeopathy and then there's a more of a modern type of homeopathy as well. Can you sort of talk a little bit about those differences? Well, I would actually argue uh, that uh, in any field of discovery, science or any other field, that it's the person who makes that discovery that gets to name it. So homeopathy re really is the system of medicine that was discovered and implemented by Samuel Hahnemann, its founder. Uh, and that doesn't mean it can't evolve, but it needs to evolve along the same epistemological lines that Hahnemann used. And he was a real scientist, you know. So there are newer approaches to homeopathy, and they may be very valuable. They may actually contribute in a variety of different ways. But if they're not following the same epistemological approach, then I would actually argue that you can't really call them homeopathy. Right. And that doesn't mean that they, they don't have value or are not useful but I think it's important to define homeopathy in a, in a very kind of narrow way uh, as the system of medicine that was um, basically discovered and created by Samuel Hahnemann. And I myself consider myself to be a Hahnemannian practitioner. And the reason for that is because if you look at the documented record, the, you know, the, the history of homeopathy that exists in transactions and in journals, you find that those people who adhered to the Hahnemannian approach, that more scientific approach to homeopathy, that they achieved a higher level of success than those who kind of diverged from that approach and used different, different ways of thinking about homeopathy. Not to say that those other ways didn't ever have success, but for me, the real key is consistency of success, that you can say that, you know, you get 80 to 90% success in your own practice. Because, you know, if you're only getting 30 or 40 or 50% success, then it's very difficult to practice because then a lot of people are coming back to you and they're not getting the results that they expected and it makes it very challenging as a practitioner. So, uh, yeah, I consider myself to be very Hanumanian in my orientation. And, you know, I'm also interested in some of these newer ideas that have uh, been introduced into homeopathic practice. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and as we know, there's different potencies in homeopathy. Um, could you give a, a brief explanation on, on how that works, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's what we call the 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 C potencies, which means that they're diluted one to one hundredth. Uh, uh, the X potencies are diluted one to one tenth, one to one out of ten. There are also what we call some people call them the LM potencies, but that's really not a correct uh, name for them. Um, they're they're one in fifty thousandth potency, so that the, the Roman numeral for that is Q. So you call those Q potencies, and this is an area actually that causes a lot of confusion for people because they say, well, you know, how can you dilute something beyond Avogadro's number? Avogadro's number means that there's not even one atom of that original substance remaining in the diluent. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, how could it possibly work? Yet we know that there's quite a bit of research that supports the action of substances that are diluted beyond the actual material existence of the original substance that was that was uh, in there. And uh, we actually document this in our film. Uh, we interviewed Dr. Brian Joseph and Nobel laureate, and he talks about how even though there's no material substance le there left, that there could be a, an arrangement of the water molecules you know, the weak bonds between the various water molecules that could have some type of biological effect. Another person who did this work is uh, Professor Luc Montagnier, who was uh, who was the co-discoverer of the HIV virus. He won the Nobel Prize for that. And subsequent to his discovery of the HIV virus and his work in AIDS, he did some, some tests where he diluted uh, bacterial strains and their DNA components beyond Avogadro's number, and he found that there were actually electromagnetic pulses that were being generated from these uh, fluids. So there's some type of information pattern that is contained in there, and when you would add that supposedly just water to a, a, a fluid of peptides, it would actually recreate that bacteria with a DNA a configuration almost exactly identical to the original bacteria. That's quite astounding. And Dr. Montagnier wasn't trying to prove anything. He was simply conducting experiments and found this to be the case. So we we do know that, and we don't know exactly how this works. There are different theories out there, nanoparticles and different ideas about how this may work. But uh, we know that there is some type of electromagnetic frequency that is produced by these substances in the water. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, the most advanced form of physics that we have today, the work of Max Planck and Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Schrodinger, all of these quantum physicists, uh, 
basically all of our technologies, our computer technologies, our phone technologies, they're all based on the principles of quantum physics, except in medicine, where we don't, we basically disregard it altogether. And we look at everything from a very materialistic perspective. And yet uh, the most advanced form of physics looks at everything at the bottom as not being material, not being atoms, but actually being energy waves. So right. um, we have a lot of support in the advanced forms of science to explain why these potentized substances, which are diluted beyond their material existence, could have an effect biologically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bringing that side of it in is important to a lot of people. Uh, and with, with the way that they think and the way they accept things into their into their mind, into their own own beings, it's not just something that somebody said, but now science, science and research is showing not only the benefits, but but why and how. And as you said, um, it is so important to a number of people. It really is. Um, and it's not only not only people who that we know that we're talking about and others that are using homeopathy, but it's also, uh, as you're probably aware, the British royal family have used homeopathy for, for so long, and that's quite well you know, mentioned and documented, not so much now, but, um, but they have been using it as one of their first calls, um, like many of us, when something goes wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have been many, many famous people throughout history, aside from just the royal family, who have employed homeopathy. Uh, I, I mean, Paul McCartney has used homeopathy, Mahatma Gandhi, um, you know, many famous actors and actresses, presidents in the United States. People don't know oftentimes that Abraham Lincoln, for example, was a, a proponent of homeopathy, uh, as was uh, William McKinley, Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, all these U.S. presidents. And they were they were appointing homeopathic doctors to high level posts in the U.S. government. So homeopathy has been used at the highest levels of society. Uh, and really, in the 19th century, uh, the most educated people, when they would contract a disease, would go to homeopaths, right? Um, because they knew that they were going to get well with a lot without a lot of the toxic of side effects associated with conventional medicines. Yeah, 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 and that that is that is huge, and it's good for you to to mention that and to share that as well, so people realize that uh, how widespread you know, homeopathy has, and for how long. You know, I didn't realize that the presidents as well had been taking, you know, right back all that length of time. That, that, that is oh, yeah. it, it's a, not, not that it needs to support it in any way, but it really brings things together for us when we're looking at a holistic approach to our, our health and well-being, how important homeopathy is. Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you used the word holistic because that's one of the things that's, uh, different about homeopathy as opposed to conventional medicine. In conventional medicine, everything you know, everything is broken apart into pieces. So you know, you have a gastroenterologist for your digestive system and a neurologist for your nervous system. But you know, we're whole beings. Yes. And you know, we you have to look at the person as a holistic process, a dynamic process, interacting with the environment around them. And that's what homeopathy does. You know, it looks at the whole being, all of the symptoms as a pattern, and tries to find that specific remedy that will improve their overall state of health. And when you give that remedy to that person, then everything just begins to get better on all levels. Everything begins to improve. Everything begins to resolve itself. And we don't need to think about, you know, dealing with your your your, your eyes and your ears and your nose and your, your stomach and your legs all separately. We find that one remedy that addresses everything. And then we allow the life energy of the person to bring the individual back to a state of health and balance. Yeah. And generally, how long when you when you uh, when you prescribe or when you give a remedy, how long before they start to notice a difference with all the, the cases and the people that you've worked with? Is there a sort of a rough time span or? That, that's a great question, Jamie. So, you know, it really depends on the person uh, and it depends on their health history. So, for example, if you have a child who comes in with a high fever or, you know, otitis media, middle ear infection, you can give a remedy and see results within minutes sometimes. You know, literally you give a remedy and the child falls asleep within 20 seconds and uh, the, mo the, the mother carries the child home and the child wakes up asymptomatic. You know, and the otitis media is gone. That's not going to happen when somebody has been sick for 30 or 40 or 50 years and they've taken a lot of various medications that have suppressed their symptomatology. You know, maybe they started off with a skin problem and then that was suppressed using, you know, 
you know, topical cortisone, and then they developed asthma, and then the asthma was suppressed using theophylline, and you know, then they got neurological issues. That's going to take a longer period to unwind. And, you know, it depends on, again, on the person, but that could take, you know, two or even three years to bring that person back to a state of health and balance. Yeah, yeah. And when you, you see it then, when you give it to a child and they fall asleep, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful sign. It's like when you give it to an animal as well. You know, we have a, a, a Maltese dog and that here, and I'm giving her something. Um, and then the first thing they do is fall asleep. And, of course, you know, everyone knows sleeping is healing. And then the Absolutely. process just allows, just comes through the body naturally. And when they wake up, uh, you know, bright-eyed and fluffy-tailed, as the old saying is, and that is the, the yeah. beauty, really of homeopathy, you know. So yeah, there's a great story about a little boy who had a middle ear infection, otitis media, and he went to a homeopath. And the kid was uh, there's two common remedies for two most common remedies from middle ear infections. There's others, but these are very very common ones, and that one is called chamomile. And the other one's called pulsatilla. And one of the very famous old-time homeopaths by the name of James Tyler Kent said, you know, you never have a difficult time differentiating between the two because you want to hold and console and, you know, rub the back of the pulsatilla child, whereas you want to literally kick the chamomile child because the chamomile child is very capricious and angry and wants something and doesn't want something. And so this child was brought in in the chamomile estate, you know, very angry, very capricious, and they couldn't even get the remedy into the child's mouth. So they, they decided, oh, well, we'll put the remedy in a glass of water and we'll give them a sip of the water. And they give the, the child a glass of water and the child hits the glass and the water spills on his face. And within two seconds, a child falls asleep on the floor they carry the child home, and as I mentioned previously, the child wakes up uh, a few hours later and has no symptoms whatsoever. Wow, yeah, amazing, isn't it? Amazing, one way or another, one way to administer it. Or another. <laughs> <That's>, Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure you've got lots and lots and lots more stories than that as well. But um, what uh, if there's one thing you'd like people to take away from this from this podcast with, with yourself and homeopathy, or well, it could be one or two or three more things, but is there something you'd like to mention to people? Well, you know, I, I really believe that the measure of morality is what we do for this generation and for the generations that follow, that we leave a better world than the one that we inherited. And homeopathy, which is based on a universal principle of nature, the law of similars. I mean, Hippocrates talked about, you know, the father of Western medicine talked about the law of similars. There's always been an empirical school of medical thought that has embraced the law of similars. And so it's based on a principle of the universe. You know, it's not something that man made up. It actually exists in nature. Uh, diseases, natural diseases, oftentimes cancel each other out because of the fact that they have similar symptomatology. So to me, the measure of morality is that we leave a better world than the one that we inherited. And if I can take whatever talents I was born with, uh, make this film uh, introducing homeopathy, and uh, get more people to be aware of homeopathy and the, and the incredible benefits they can offer to them, then I feel that I've done something of value on this planet. And uh, I can, you know, we're all mortal. We're all going to pass on. And uh, if we can do something to make it better for the next, for the people who follow, then uh, then we've done something of real value. And I and I'm doing what I can yes. based on my own experience and the and the and the great gifts that homeopathy has given me. I want to give something back. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That is, um, for people who are interested to find out about the uh, about the film, um, when do you think it will be sort of released? What sort of time span do you think to release around the world? Well, we, we are currently in uh, discussion with Netflix to have it released. We were hoping to have it released as a Netflix original because that would get quite a bit of promotion. Uh, but we have been getting in the interim a lot of people who have been asking to uh, see the film uh, before that because we're not sure how long that will actually take. It's a, kind of a an ongoing lengthy type of a process. So uh, if you go to our website, introducinghomeopathy.com and sign up for our newsletter, we will inform people when the uh, private next private screening will be made available. So again, you can just go to introducing and the word homeopathy spelled H-O-M-E-O-P-A-T-H-Y. So introducing homeopathy.com. You go there, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, if you want to make a financial donation to the film, that would be greatly appreciated as well. And we'll let you know as soon as the next uh, viewing is available. 
Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I mean, that is that's great, and and we'll put those links um, down below, and I'll get those off you and that as well, and uh, any other links that you find you know, or you feel is relevant uh, for people to to not only to educate themselves um, about homeopathy, but um, but what the wonderful work that so many homeopaths are doing around the world. So, um, Kim, Kim and Leah, thank you very much. Introducing homeopathy.com. We'll put those links in that down below. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful chat, and I'm sure we could have done two or three times the, the length of this. So maybe in the future we might be able to, to get you back for another one from there. I, I, I love it. I love it. And thank you for inviting me to be on here. To, no, to share yeah. My thoughts. yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, please, everybody, I only mentioned it once, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Um, and the thank to our, to our sponsor, Share, at, um, um, oh, I've forgotten her, her, uh, her details, but I'll put them down below anyway. So uh, we'll do that. But uh, Kim, thank you again. That's been wonderful. And I wish you all the best, you know, in Florida. And when you come to Europe, we would love to love to meet up with you for sure. So thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie.